Like a lot of stories in, at universities, mine began in the corridors and lobby of the Health Sciences Building when almost five years ago I happened to bump into a colleague uh, who had just come from a speech in the, in the library on the whole business about the repository and uh, how it would enhance one's citations. And he was in a big hurry and said, I promise I'll circulate the slides when I get them. And right enough he did. And by the time the slides had arrived, it had already been planted in my head that this would be a good idea uh, to engage with it. Because over the time since I first began to publish, I was very conscious from international partners and others that there had been a shift from emphasis on journal uh, impact factor to individual citations. Not that impact factor had gone away or, or wasn't important. I mean, it is still a proxy to the standard of a journal uh, and to the standard of the article that gets into that journal. Uh, but this was a new sort of uh, way by which one's um, activities would be judged and so on. So, uh, so I was aware of the benefits. And I'll just really quickly run through these. Uh, clearly, uh, it makes the work accessible to out of reach populations. Uh, Putting your work on the research repository means that people in developing countries or newly industrialized countries or people who are not even at university um, can access your work and this is a major benefit uh, globally. In terms of self-serving motives, which academics never consider, uh, it, it, it does increase your personal citations or it should, it, it, the idea is that if your work is available openly, it's likely to Im impact on your h-index. And There's another thing uh, called uh, the i-index or the, the i-10 I I index, yeah, uh, so it impacts on these. And there's also a benefit for your institution. Uh, because according to the uh, QS World Rankings uh, methodology, 20% of the whole lot of those indicators uh, that whereupon they measure research activity is citations per faculty. So there are benefits all around there. Back to the story. So uh, that Christmas, it was five years ago, 2012, uh, it was coming up to Christmas, November, and I thought it's one of, the, it's one of these jobs, basically, like the way you say to yourself constantly, I must <coughs> update my, my profile, and I must do that. And it's on some list that you never get around to because there's always the next publication to respond to, and so on. But I thought, go for it. And what it meant from, in my case, and I'm sure it's probably not much different for others, is going back over the archives. And to this stage, I had to go back for 15 years' work and find what is the really penultimate draft, or the last draft that I had uh, dealt with as corresponding our main and main author before it got final finish from the publisher. So it's post peer reviewed, but before the final uh, version is put together by the publishers. And that's an awful lot of work. And there's a certain sense of you're going back rather than forward. However, it's worth it because by doing that, your publications are working away for you, almost like earning interest while you can get on with the rest, so it is worth doing. In terms of formatting, it was Word documents that, that I had access to in my own files, and um, I put them together, something like this, and you have to get over the fact that there may be some uh, minor differences between what is actually in the published version, and sometimes these are sort of typos and things that would normally drive people who publish uh, mad and would mortify them, I'm sure, Am I the only one who's ever seen something that's slipped in, a, a rogue apostrophe or something? Um, but, but you, you know, you, this is uh, usually, and, and if you go back a number of years, you don't actually have access to the final proof that you maybe had manipulated by hand. Now it's changed, of course, but there is still a level at which the final version is a little bit different. Uh, so I uploaded, uh, well, now I, I think there are about 48 items up there. Really, it's only the ones where you're the main author or corresponding author because you don't really have access to the uh, final version of ones that you're a co-author on and you don't really want to put pressure on your colleagues to kind of do all that, pe that, that work. Uh, you make them aware that it, it, it's up and, and, and hope that they may put the article up. But it, it's a little bit out of your control from that point of view. What do people see? Well, if they see your list on a table of contents or something like that, uh, they can put in the article title, maybe their institution doesn't have that journal, uh, maybe they're not even at an institution, and they come up and they get, they, oops, sorry, I beg your pardon, I've gone ahead. They, they see a PDF version of your article, and uh, they, when, they, when they go into that, this is open access for everybody, 
um, the, the library will have uh, nicely presented what you sent them in and the article might be slightly different from what you sent in as far as it's tidied up uh, for consistency and presentation. So, oh yeah, so the story is then what, uh, what happens next. You've put all the articles up. Well, every month you get an email from the library to tell you how things are doing as far as downloads are concerned. And the information is actually uh, fairly useful. For example, it'll tell you uh, what, uh, how many downloads you had in the previous month since the start. Um, there, in my case, it's 12,822. It tells you the average downloads per item. Last month was five. The previous month was four, so things are improving. And uh, so you, you, can, you can track your own progress. So if you scroll down in that email from the library, it tells you other things, like uh, your top downloads for your articles. And can I just say, these are not the articles I would have chosen as being my best. They just happen to be the ones that were cited. Um, and also the top downloads for your school. And if you're getting a big head because you think that, that you're the one who's most uh, downloaded from your school, it may be because nobody else has really put their articles up. They may be cited a lot more than yours. And to really stop you getting a big head, if you think that 2,000 plus uh, downloads is wonderful for one article, uh, just read down at what the, um, what the top 10 for UCD are. And the top one there is over 16,000. So just bear that in mind. Okay. Now, the other information that's really useful every month, I think this one is, and uh, I don't, I mean, I, I have to be honest here in that I've only gone into it in preparation for this presentation. I actually often saw the link but never quite got into that. And that'll tell you, oops, sorry, um, that'll tell you um, the year. You can, you can compare differences here according to the year and also the countries. And among the countries, Ireland is a non-UCD Ireland, excluding UCD as the highest, then UK, United States. Um, etc, etc. But among those are newly industrialising countries like India and Indonesia and China. So, so, so it is getting out there uh, to places that wouldn't otherwise uh, have access to this. Um, this is the list. It actually gives you the list of the raw numbers, the numbers of downloads, and also the percentage. Now, once you get past, with the volume of, of countries that actually have accessed or downloaded, not just access, but downloaded the articles, um, it, you're talking about very tiny proportions because that's not the whole list. The next, th this is part. This is where the list continues and continues again. So those three uh, screenshots are actually uh, the list for where countries, uh, where the, the uh, article was downloaded from. Uh, so you can see a wide variety there, including developing countries. Um, now, the big thing, downloads are one thing, and I think we all have the experience of downloading all around us and never again opening the article. Uh, so how many get translated into citations in Scopus, in, in, or in journals that are uh, linked to Scopus? I don't know is the answer, and I don't know if there is a way of, of tracking that. Uh, one can track one's H-index, uh, at least one, one can, can find out what it is, and I... My assumption is that it helps, it must help, that your articles are out there. The other thing it does is that some researchers request a final article uh, if they have come across it somewhere, and usually those tend to be uh, senior academics or their research assistants more often that say, can I have the copy of your article on? And there is quite a high chance, if they have already read the article on, in a pre-final uh, version, that they will cite it. So... That's just a final thing, and it, it really, it was just, to, I suppose, to, um, to make you aware, for those of you who are not aware of this website, before you even get to the repository, if you're considering where to publish, it gives you an idea of which journals will allow, uh, will allow this kind of preprint um, archiving. Uh, the library checks it for you, so you don't need to worry about the library, but this, uh, just if, at, at the point of put, sending off article, Articles gives you an indication. There, there is a, a white category there uh, where archiving is not formally supported, so people might want to think about that. So that's the um, end, and thank you for listening. <laughs>